You're listening to the Author Stories Podcast. Bringing you the story behind the stories and the storytellers. Margaret Wyatt, Terry Brooks, Sheena Kamal, Matthew Quick, JT Ellison, Walt D. Williams, Brad Ford, Corey, Dr. O, Brandon Sanders, Robin Mom, Ernest Klein, Jim Butcher, Sherwin Harris. Visit HankGarner.com for archives of all the shows. Today's guest is Authors, I have a fantastic new service to tell you about. It's called PubSite. PubSite is a service to help you build your very own website, your home on the web, where you can promote your work and give your fans a place to connect with you. PubSite is a website platform that allows every author, regardless of budget, to have a great-looking professional website. Developed by the book marketing professionals at FSB Associates, PubSite is the new easy-to-use DIY website builder developed specifically for books and authors. Whether you're an author of one book or 20, or a small publisher, PubSite allows you to build, design, and most importantly, update your website pain-free. No need to be dependent on a designer or webmaster to make a small but costly change to your website. Save the money and do it yourself. PubSite is the best platform for authors because it's a book-centric platform. PubSite was built just for authors and small publishers. Every design, feature, and layout is book-centric. They have customized designs for you to use. It's easy to build. No coding or HTML is necessary to create a stunning, professional-looking website with all the features you want. Get a custom domain name, yourname.com. It's simple to update. You can add all of your books, add a blog and a book tour, sell from any retailer, manage your email list and social media, and even do e-commerce. Build your website with a 14-day free trial, then pay just $19.99 per month, which includes hosting. And we offer packages starting at $499 to set up the website for you. Pub-Site.com, the place to help authors find their home on the web. Before We Ever Spoke by Dan Largent Cleveland, Ohio, 2006. After a chance encounter, three people soon find out that life can sometimes thrust us into the public eye even when taking great measures to avoid it. Cooper Madison was the best pitcher in baseball after being drafted number one overall in 1996 from the small Gulf Coast town of Pass Christiane, Mississippi. One year after announcing his sudden and shocking retirement, he finds himself seeking anonymity in Cleveland, Ohio. Kara Knox is the youngest sibling to three older brothers. After a tragic work accident to her closest relative, she has built up a tough exterior as she begins her final year of college at Cleveland State University. Jason Knox, Kara's oldest brother, is the lead detective on Cleveland's Edgewater Park Killer case. After months without a suspect, he's feeling the heat from his media-hungry chief. Serendipity intervenes, and all three learn that perception and reality are paths that rarely ever intersect. Before We Ever Spoke by Dan Largent Hey, folks, you really ought to check out Patricia Gillum's Heroes of Corvus uh, series. Uh, Book one is called A Superhero's Duty, a fight between a second-generation superhero named Red Bolt and a villain for hire named Icarus goes terribly wrong, resulting in the drowning deaths of three innocent civilians and orphaning a six-year-old boy. Racked with guilt, Red Bolt visits Cameron Wilson at the hospital every night and won't leave the boy's side until he falls asleep. Befriended by a night shift nurse, the man in costume begins to disclose what really happened after the fight and why he feels the death of Cameron's parents and sister fall on his actions. A superhero didn't survive that night and Cameron and the rest of the city are not out of danger. A Superhero's Duty, book one of the Heroes of Corvus by Patricia Gillum. Get this series now. Well, thanks for joining me again for the Author Stories Podcast, where I bring you the story behind the stories and the storytellers. Today, I am super excited to have Jan Eliasberg on the show with me. She has a phenomenal new book called Hannah's War uh, that is one of the best historical thrillers um, I think I've ever read. Um, Jan, welcome to the show today. 
Thank you. What a nice welcome. Um, that's a that that really makes me feel good. What you said. Oh well, it's it's absolutely the truth. Um, I, I love the book, and uh, when I got it a few weeks ago, it I just fell right into it, and it was one of those stories that that captivated me from the from the cover copy, and uh, it you know it it didn't let me go until the end, and uh, I think that's probably the best compliment you can give a book. Thank you. I agree. The the one that sweeps you away and won't let you go and you stay up all night reading it right. instead of sleeping, right? Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Well, Jen, we begin each show with the same question uh, each time, and that question is, what is your first memory of wanting to be a writer or storyteller? Okay. Uh, I know exactly. Um, when I was 10... But my my mother and father were big believers in taking their children to have kind of almost adult experiences, which was unusual in in those days. So, for instance, they took us to Europe um, and we rented a car and drove all around Europe. And the the thing was that my mom was not not the best driver. Um, And when you add in French drivers who are a little bit aggressive um, and mostly men, um, she would get very flustered and she'd sort of, you know, pull into an intersection in a little French town and just like put on the brakes. And one time I remember she actually rolled down the window and stuck her her fingers in her ears and went, yeah, 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 at at a French driver. So at some point in there, I began to feel like it was it it would be good if I could somehow make my younger brother and sister feel safe. And so I started telling stories and they they would start as actual maybe like stories I'd read in a book or I remember telling a story about Cleopatra and then gradually, because, you know, it worked and they, they, they did get so enchanted, the stories just went on forever. And I'd wind in things that were happening on the road or things that were happening in the hotel or a character that I'd seen in a, in a town. And that idea, I think, of storytelling as a way of creating a world that made people feel safe. It's kind of ironic to be saying this when everybody is now panicked and terrified (laughs) of what's going on in the outside world. But I think that was very much the, the inspiration for me was how can I tell a story that's so involving that people will forget that maybe we're about to have a car accident or um, dealing with coronavirus or what, you know, what, whatever the, the outside world was, uh, was, was up to um, that, that we could find some kind of safety and comfort in and healing in the story. Well, and I think during this time uh, where we're all so isolated and, um, um, worried about the outside world around us um so many of us are turning back to stories to uh to find comfort and this is you know it, it it's it, it everything is full circle you know we we um the the when we find ourselves lacking uh for explanations about things we we dig into a story there there's something about the the human condition that is expressed through storytelling that, uh, you know, we, we feel the need to, to comfort others with story probably because of all of the ways that we have been comforted ourselves. Yes. And, you know, if you go back in history, you have people around a campfire or in the, you know, with Greek theater, because I, I studied theater, you know, you have everybody in town gathering in the amphitheater to see these, these stories acted out and that was clearly a way to address the social and political upheavals of the time. So you're right. It's not just the story. It's also the sense of connection 
that the story builds. So it's the, the connection of hearing something together or the connection you feel with characters uh, in a book. Exactly. Um, Jan, did uh, was there ever a time when um, a grown-up, someone of influence, a, a parent, a teacher maybe, uh, recognized this uh, storytelling gift that you had? Yes. Um, my grandmother, um, uh, my mother's mother, who was very dramatic and theatrical and and um, <laughs> turned out to be bipolar, actually, but was, you know, just the most impressive figure. Um, I remember hearing her talking to my parents and saying something to the effect of, you know, that, that, that this girl has something special. She, she, she knows how to captivate people and you, you have to, I think she was kind of saying you have to give her what she needs. Um, and I remember that very clearly. And then I remember it being sort of picked up again when I was in, uh, sixth grade. Um, I went to a, a, a very traditional, but very high quality school. Um, but there was a wonderful drama teacher who came in and, we were studying Chaucer and she taught us how to speak the prologue to the Canterbury tales in Chaucerian English. And we actually, I could do it for you now. Um, I don't know that your, your listeners really want that, but I absolutely could. Um, and that I think was the birth of it. It was this sense of like, um, of, of, of where life was in the middle of a kind of education that was much more, cerebral. Um, and again, I say very, very good education, but not necessarily one that sparked a lot of imagination. So when my imagination was sparked was different, definitely. Uh, and I will say one other thing, just because it's a wonderful tribute to, to the school I went to when I had my kickoff party, uh, for the book, um, we were on the Upper East Side, uh, which is where I grew up. Um, I don't live there now, but um, and there was a, a woman in the in the like second row, and she kept looking at me, and I was looking at her and thinking, God, she looks familiar. And finally, I turned my attention to her, and she said, "I'm I'm Frances Tolliver, your twelfth grade English teacher." Now. <laughs> that was a fairly long time ago. And uh, the fact that she had come because she'd seen my name, the fact that she, you know, was, she, I immediately remembered that she had given me a special um, class with uh, Shakespeare dramas. It was like a, you know, it was like a tutorial almost. And I was kind of joking with her and I said, you know, what did you think when you saw that I'd written a novel? And she said, I thought, um, it's about time. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I love that. I love that. Um, Jan, what did you, uh, what did you study in school and what was your ambition, uh, for career wise? So I was pretty clear that I wanted to be a director, a theater director, actually, um, and I think that talking about the, you know, the, the plays of the Greeks, of uh, Euripides, um, was, was kind of the impetus for that. Um, I went to uh, Wesleyan University and, um, they didn't have much of a theater program. <laughs> um, so what I ended up doing was I ended up st sort of founding a student run theater and, and it which still exists, by the way, and which was the um, the sort of petri dish for Lin Manuel Miranda for In the Heights. That's where he developed his first musical. So I feel partially responsible for giving the world Lin. Um, I, I I was I was trying to feed. So my mother my mother was a writer. My mother was a journalist and a memoirist, and she. 
uh, wrote a lot about families, about um, psychoanalysis, um, travel. And I think, and I was a bit of a daddy's girl, and I think that my father really wanted me, kind of treated me like a firstborn son. And I think he wanted me to have a career that was more flashy, for lack of a better word. He, I don't think he understood what it means to be a writer. And, and I don't think he wasn't much of a reader. So I think he probably didn't see that as being a worthy career. Um, and so I think that what I did, as children do to both please their parents and to answer the inner need, was I think that I kind of came upon directing as a way to tell stories and also a way to have a career that my father felt proud of and connected to. Um, and that kind of, you know, it was sort of, uh, from Wesleyan, I went to London for um, for two years, and I worked at a lot of theaters in London, and I was seeing this just exciting theater, you know, where you could literally see three productions of Merchant of Venice, and they would be telling three different stories because of how they were directed. And um, so that was really that was really what I came back to the States wanting to do. And I went to Yale uh, drama school and within the confines of Yale, I was able to do that. Um, it was, it was three of the best years of my life um, because I had all of these wonderful actors and, you know, and just a thousand theaters or, you know, founded a summer theater. So I was, I was doing, and I was doing the place I loved. I was doing Shakespeare. I was doing Ibsen. I was doing some wonderful new plays. Um, the Greeks. Um, I have, I did a production of the Greeks. I have photos that was supposedly the way the Greeks used to do it. It was Aristophanes, the birds, and it was raunchy and, um, and, and funny. Um, and kind of embarrassing for a couple of the actors in it, but, but you know, that was the way it was supposed to be. Um, and I, I kind of had this very rude awakening when I graduated from Yale and I had been the only woman there. I was really, without blowing my horn, horn too much, I was considered kind of a star and I was, I got a job right out of Yale. Um, and I was associate artistic director of a theater in St. Louis. And when I got out there, I realized that this kind of theater that I was interested in doing was not happening in St. Louis. Um, you know, they, they did not really want to see some, you know, very politically astute production of Measure for Measure. They, they wanted to see another version of Christmas Carol. And so I sort of, I thought, this isn't going to work. Um, I had made a choice not to, I had been offered a job in London, but I would have had to become an English citizen. I had made a choice not to do that. Um, and so I thought, well, let me try film. So I think when you see my career, you see a sort of series of ways that I was trying to tell stories, the stories I really, really wanted to tell. And I would say Hannah's War is right there. It's, you know, it's a female lead. It's um, characters in very high stakes um, circumstances. It has layers of political um, machinations and a lot to say about uh, a kind of a, 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 ter a so like a, a turning point in society with the development of the atomic bomb. The, the, when I say Shakespeare and Brecht and Ibsen, that's kind of what I'm talking about, those kinds of stories. And I think that my career was just uh, like a series of experiments of you know, where can, where can I find the place to actually 
tell the stories I want to tell. So, is, yeah. I'm, I'm sorry. Um, tell us about stumbling onto this story um, that eventually became Hannah's War, because um, like like you've described, uh, your career has been um, kind of one uh, one door opens and, and then, you know, another door opens and and kind of following where the story leads you um, that that um, comes with a, a sort of curiosity, I, I would imagine, that uh, that enables you to uh, to stay curious and to, to, to keep looking for for where the next story is. Tell us about stumbling on to this this character of Dr. Hannah Weiss. OK, um, I'm going to make one little correction. Now. Sure. It wasn't one door opening and then another. It was me kicking down one door <laughs> after another. <laughs> That's even better. Because honestly, a woman in Hollywood who wants to be an auteur director does not have doors opening right, left, and center. Um, so, um, yes, so that's probably a good place to, to start. So, yes, I think that that curiosity is what has kept me passionate and what has sort of following that curiosity is exactly what has kept me on this trail. Um and I, I did stumble on this story, honestly, because I was in the New York Public Library and I was researching a completely different story. Um, it was actually kind of an autobiographical novel that I thought was going to be my first novel. Um, and I thought, oh, it would be really interesting if the um, these two characters met um, on or around uh, the end of the war. And so I just was in the microfiche room and I, for fun, <laughs> I went and looked at the headline um, on the day that we bombed Hiroshima. And it was it was like a world opened. You had this huge headline you know, Truman vows, reign of ruin. And then there was a historical kind of recap, if you will, because the Manhattan Project had happened completely in secret. And nobody, until we dropped the bomb, knew what it was or how it had happened. So so the, the Times, being the paper of record, had to explain to the world how this thing had come about. And below the fold, there was a paragraph and a, a set, a sort of innocuous sentence that I read. It said, the key component that allowed the allies to develop the bomb was brought to us by a female non-Aryan, and that was in quotes, physicist. And I looked at that and I thought, what? what, what, who is this woman? Who is this Jewish woman? What is her name? Because they didn't mention it. Why isn't she in every single science textbook in, 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 in circulation? What a story. I'm going to find it. I'm going to tell it. I mean, almost all of that in one second went through my mind. And of course, I had no idea what that was going to, the kind of insane mission that that was going to set me off on. But following my curiosity and finding that woman, um, and then going deeper and deeper into the building of the bomb, the race between the Germans and the Allies, which everybody thought was a race, but actually wasn't really a race. Um, I just began to find this world that I knew nothing about. And I thought to see this from the point of view of a woman, the last thing you would expect, really, because certainly Los Alamos was a world of men. And, and, and actually all of physics, really, nuclear physics, I mean, the the story really starts at the Kaiser Wilhelm Institute in Berlin um, because the real woman, Dr. Lisa Meitner, was the only woman who worked there at the Kaiser Wilhelm. And she she was unusual because she was 
a genius. And so people had sort of given her waivers and passes to keep, to keep working. Um, and I, I just, I just fell in love with, with her, with the idea of science as this collaborative, um, artistic, creative process. And then I really think that what, what sort of created the, the, the structure of the story for me was the idea that you have a Jewish woman working on pure science in this elite institute as the Nazis are rising to power. And she is working on the discovery of something that is literally going to change history. And it could be for good or it could be for really evil. And I thought, okay, she had, she was there the day that Hitler, I think it was maybe Albert Speer, they, they walked into one of the assemblies at the auditorium in the morning and they said, this is no longer a research institute. This is a military um, base of the Third Reich. And she had wow. to flee within six hours. Um, and then I thought, what happens when a woman who has seen that, who has seen what happens when pure science becomes militarized, what happens if I place her at Los Alamos, where she's watching it happen all over again, um, in a in a much subtler way, but still, it's it's the same tensions, it's it's the scientists who are sort of on fire because a scientist cannot resist discovery, and. So the military kind of took all these geniuses and found this crazy place in the middle of the desert where they really couldn't get out or talk to anybody except each other, strung barbed wire around the, the facility. So I almost thought, this is almost like a concentration camp in a weird way. I mean, there just seemed to be so many echoes of the German experience and the American. And, and there are the military trying to keep the scientists working so that they can get this weapon. And the scientists start with a very um, kind of patriotic, uh, well, it, for a lot of them, you know, a lot of the, most of the scientists were Jewish or were emigres from Eastern Europe, Germany, France. And so they were really doing this because they were terrified that Hitler was going to get the bomb first. And they felt like they had to get it before he did. And then at a certain point in the war, everything shifted. And I was watching a wonderful documentary called The Day After Trinity that interviewed a lot of the best scientists that were in the inner circle. And one of them said, Everything I know about myself tells me on VE Day, when I knew the Germans didn't have the bomb, because they would have used it if they'd had it, I should have turned on my heel and walked away. But I didn't. I had to know what would happen. I had to know if it would work. And that just that just stayed with me. Uh, and, and that's what kept me digging deeper and deeper and ultimately made me feel like I must, I must write this as a, as a novel. What, uh, what a great juxtaposition. Um, it, it is, uh, with Hannah's story, uh, scientist placed on this, this backdrop of, um, you know, people with their own agendas and, uh, you know, warring nations. And uh, it, it, it's such a great contrast. Um, it, this, like I said earlier, this book reads um, like one of the best um, political thrillers that, that, that I've ever read. Um, what, what brings that aspect of the story in? Um, we know that this can't just be about Hannah and her altruistic pursuits. 
Um, <laughs> she she has to get into some trouble along the way. What uh, what happens to Hannah? Well, you know, that's the filmmaker in me. Um, the filmmaker in me is the one who says if a story doesn't grab you from the first, you know, five minutes, you're going to walk out of the theater or you're going to turn off the television or you're going to throw the book across the room. Um, and so, you know, that kind of, I guess, um, I was, I was, Exactly as you said, I got to the point where I realized, well, I'm not writing a biopic about Dr. Lisa Meitner because she's she's wonderful. She she's an amazing woman, but uh, that that story has limitations, and it's not going to get me into the kinds of worlds and questions that I really want want to be living in, and so I of course knew that one of the things that happened at Los Alamos was that, you know, everybody was terrified. Uh, it was a very paranoid environment. The scientists were being spied on all the time. Their conversations were being um, uh, wiretapped. Um, their movements were being tracked. They couldn't leave the base without some, really a lot of times they had escorts. Uh, but certainly they couldn't leave without telling where they were going and signing back in. And so I thought, well, she's a woman and she has her own agenda and she's behaving mm, strangely. And it seemed to me like a, an espionage story would be a wonderful way to take all of these grand ideas and put them in a form that was that was captivating for the reader. Um, I mean, I, I think preaching at a reader is is a terrible idea. <laughs> um, and I think it's so much better when you can, you know, when you can create a movie like The Third Man, say, you know, which is just, a, a, a suspenseful thriller with all chases and, and mysteries, but it's also about the black market after the war and what people will do to survive and how Vienna was divided up between, you know, Russians and English and Americans. Um, so, you know, that in some ways that's always been my, my sort of, goal. I, I don't, I don't really want to tell stories that are, are small and are just sort of, um, you know, curiosities. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm not, I'm not setting out to write bestsellers, but I'm certainly setting out to tell a story that's compelling enough to keep people reading and to let all that other stuff just, just be there, you know, and, and, you, the the sort of challenge of being able to tell some of those really strange and really interesting political details, the what the military was up to, what you know how, for instance, um, uh, Hoover, you know, was just apoplectic when when General Grove said that J. Robert Oppenheimer was going to run Los Alamos because they'd been tailing Oppenheimer for years. He was a communist. And, you know, and, and Hoover was like, what are you talking about? You know, can't, he's, a, he's a communist. And in fact, almost everybody who worked there was a communist or had communist leanings. And, you know, so, so, so there was General Groves kind of going, I need him because I know he's the man who can do this job. And he's the one that the other scientists will listen to and respect. But then I've got Hoover over here, like checking his every move. And when we get the bomb, and I think this is a tremendous tragedy, basically Oppenheimer was was hounded to, to death, really, by the FBI. Um, after he had done this remarkable thing. So 
I, I wanted all of those layers to be in there, but in a way that was um, that was really compelling. So I so I thought, well, espionage thriller is a pretty good pretty good vehicle for all of that. Absolutely, it is. Um, Jan, did I read that uh, you originally wrote this as a screenplay and uh, intended uh, to have this uh, as a feature film? Uh, yes. I mean, what I, I would say that I always went back and forth. Um, when I originally came upon the idea in the, in the public library, I was certain it was going to be a novel and I was, you know, uh, that was, that was where my notes were sort of leading me. And then at some point, I think, uh, oh, Yes. Okay. I can tell you. Um, so I went to, um, I went, I went to, I got an MFA in fiction at, uh, uh, MFA program for writers at Warren Wilson. And I actually worked on, on this book with Charlie Baxter. And, um, when I graduated and didn't have the structure of that, and I kept getting offered jobs as a director, I thought, well, maybe I should make this into a screenplay because or take this material and make it a screenplay because here I am with this directing career. Um, and I would love to do this film. So, um, so I did, I, I wrote it as a screenplay. It had many, many, many drafts. I can't even tell you 50 more probably. And, um, Nobody would make it. And I think, you know, that had something to do with the fact that I wanted to direct it. Um, And I just got so kind of, I had to get this story out there. That's what I felt. And a screenplay is a wonderful thing, but a screenplay is an unfinished thing. A screenplay is the blueprint for a film. Sure. And if if the film isn't going to get made, then the screenplay might as well not exist. And so I started to think, you know, I've always wanted to write. I, I've dipped my toe into this fiction thing. Like over the course of my life, you know, I went back, I got an MFA. I was writing this autobiographical novel. I was taking these writing classes and – I think I got to a point where I just felt like I am really um, done directing stories that aren't mine. I need to start telling my own stories. And so that was the big leap of faith for me, was just saying, okay, I'm going to turn down every directing job I'm offered until this book is finished. Wow. Wow. Yeah. You you described a uh, screenplay as as an unfinished project, um, and uh, getting something made, um, and and through the whole creative process to 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 see a movie on the screen is an extremely collaborative process. There's so many people involved, and I would imagine so many people's input, um, and and novel writing is is collaborative in a sense. Um, that, you, you know, to get published, uh, there, there are usually some other voices, uh, editorial voices and, and, and that sort that, that help you to shape that. But for the most part, it is, uh, it's the author's vision from, from start to finish. There may be some, some people that help shape that vision, but, but it's, it's pretty much your thing from start to finish. Um, was that a, a fulfilling process for you as, as someone who has worked collaborative, collaboratively so much. Uh, how was this process for you to get your vision out into the hands of people as your fully formed thing? I, it was the best creative process of my life. I was really, once I made the decision to do this, uh, every moment was even, even the horrible moments when I had you know, I didn't really have writer's block exactly because I had so much of the uh, structure for the story before I started actually, 
you know, write, writing the book. Um, but I just, I just was, I was in heaven. Um, and I also, it was kind of a Cinderella story because I wrote it, you know, every, everyone hopes they're going to get published, right? But at, by the time I got to writing this book, I had kind of made an agreement with myself that I was going to write it whether it got published or not, that that I would just be happy if I got this story into an actual form where I could hold it in my hands and say, this is it. And, you know, self-publish it if I wanted to. And, you know, nobody has to raise any money. I don't have to get any stars attached. I can hand you the book. And there it is. So then to have it sell <laughs> and not only to have it sell, but to have it sell to Judy Klein at Little Brown. And Judy is just the most wonderful editor. And I was treated with such respect. Um, with, I sound like a battered wife or something because you know your position in Hollywood sometimes you feel a little bit like a battered wife but but you know I mean Judy's notes were wonderful and they were all in service of the story every note she gave me you know was like a light bulb like oh oh I know exactly how I can do that and then I would go and do more and I mean down to the point where they they let me have a lot of input on the cover, um, you know, and I was like, I don't know, I'm a first time novelist. Like, do I get to say that I don't really like this first design? And and they were Judy was like, yes, of course you do. You know, send us send us inspirations. And I did. And lo and behold, my inspirations were translated into a gorgeous cover. Um, so it it really has been everything I dreamed of. Yeah. That's amazing. Um, Jan, Hannah's story is, uh, is, is fascinating from, from beginning to end. Um, and it, it's obvious why um, this book is resonating with so many people. But there, there has, uh, there has seemed to be, over the last few years, um, a resurged interest in this time period, and uh, there's a lot of fantastic uh, historical fiction that is coming out around this period of time. Why do you think it is that we as readers are really connecting with these people and these stories um, right now in this time that we find ourselves in? Well, I mean, this is a this is a very sad thing to say, but I think it's true. Um, as I was writing the book, I was just just gobsmacked by how relevant things that I was writing were to today. Um, you know, the way, for example. Um, the, the Nuremberg laws were written and the way Hannah was persuaded by her colleagues that, you know, she really didn't have anything to worry about that, you know, she was a well-respected scientist and she would be fine. And then, you know, and then she had ice chasing her, um, you know, to put her in a, well, a cage. Um, I also, you know, realized that there was a lot more anti-Semitism in America at that time than people like to admit. I think people, you know, Americans like to think it was a very German thing. You know, those those terrible Germans who had these idiotic, you know, beliefs. But the truth is, you know, Henry Ford had published the Protocols of the Elders of Zion. And he's thanked by Hitler in Mein Kampf. So, so you sort of ask yourself where that began. Um, and so I think that those, I think those resonances keep us, keep us interested 
hopefully because we don't want history to repeat itself. Um, but I also think that there is definitely a feeling of a kind of deep heroism that people found in themselves. Certainly Hannah finds that. Um, I think Jack, I think all of my three leads actually find that, um, although you don't necessarily know it right away. But, um, and I, I think, I think that we kind of long for that actually, you know, I, I, I've been thinking now with all of these sort of you know, people talking about the pandemic and what we should do and, you know, and Everyone I know is 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 crushing on Andrew Cuomo um, because because he's he's found that thing that sort of I'm you know this is I'm I'm gonna I'm gonna take this on I'm gonna be honest about it um, I'm gonna be real but I'm gonna ask better of you uh, you know I, 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 I so I do think people are longing for a kind of um, to find a sense of heroism and, and, and a time when something is maybe more important than, right. you know, what, what the next Apple uh, phone is going to do or, you know, what, what, what toys you're going to buy or, you know, it's, it's, we, we kind of found ourselves in a very consumer driven culture Um with a lot of problems around the edges that people hadn't really been reckoning with, like, like climate change and, uh, you know, pandemics. And I think, I think people would like to connect with the part of America, the part of people that rises to the occasion. The book is called Hannah's War and it's available everywhere now. Um, Jan, this has been, uh, so much fun, uh, chatting with you about the book. If people are, uh, are intrigued by this and want to dig into all of the great stuff that you do, is there a place where they can connect with you online? Yes. Um, they should go to my website, which is www.jan, J-A-N, Eliasberg, E-L-I-A-S-B-E-R-G.com. And the website has uh, it kind of is divided into two sections. It has the the book on one. There's a picture of me in the middle. No, there's actually a, a picture of the book cover in the middle. And then on one side there's the book, and the other side there's my film work. And so I've actually tried to bring everything into one place. And I have so much in there: articles. Um, um, I've done a lot of um, video pieces about different aspects of the book. I talk a lot about Lisa Meitner and her actual life because she absolutely should have won the Nobel Prize. Um, that's another piece of this story that we didn't really touch on. But her partner, with whom she was working, and... Um, Many would say, I would say from the research, that she was the one who was kind of driving that collaboration. Um, he won the Nobel Prize in 1945, and he never mentioned her name at the, at the ceremony. Out of so, time. you know, that's, amazing. that's an injustice that I wish could be righted. Um, but, you know, there's just so much information, and I have... I have tried to put as much as possible in a really fun form, interesting form, um, on my website. So it's www.janeliasberg.com. Excellent. We'll put links to all of that in the show notes, and there'll be links where you can buy the book in Kindle edition, or audiobook, or hardcover. Uh, it's available in all of those formats right now. Uh, Jan, thank you so much for taking time to come on the show today. Thank you. This was a pleasure. I loved it. I love talking with you. 